Good night and welcome to the Thursday Night Bible Study. A journey through the Bible continues. Tonight we're looking at really Israel in exile, part two, but it should almost be entitled Gentile World Kingdoms of Significance in the Bible. And that is because when we get into the book of, books of Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, many of them from here on in the Bible are in the condition of Israel being in exile, but being under the rulership of Gentile kings. Going all the way through the Romans when the Lord Jesus Christ walked the earth and Caesar, Augustus, was the ultimate ruler of Israel. They had their own local rulership, but he was the top king over Israel. And we're going to see that these Gentile rulers of empires come into play in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah and Daniel and many of these other books all the way through the Old Testament. And what's fascinating about them is you have five Gentile empires where these Gentile kings rule over Israel. And God is working through these Gentile kings. And the empires start with Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, when Nebuchadnezzar took an army, went into Israel, and destroyed Jerusalem, destroyed the Jewish temple, took all the beautiful treasures from the Jewish temple, killed a lot of the princes of Israel, took the wicked king of, it, of uh, Judah, Zedekiah, murdered his sons in front of him and his princes in front of him, and took his eyes out and took him in chains back to Babylon. And God had warned by Jeremiah over and over again. Unless you turn back to God, God is going to send in a king from the east and he's going to destroy your nation and take you captive. And God warned them he would spew them out of the land if they continued to engage in wickedness. And that's what they did. And we studied that last time. Here, we're continuing with that study. And we're going to deal with the book of Ezra today. But. When you look at these five empires, they are represented by a figure that God Almighty gave a dream to King Nebuchadnezzar after King Nebuchadnezzar had gone into Israel and destroyed Jerusalem and took them captive and destroyed other nations in the land of Canaan and in the land of Israel as well. After that, when Daniel was in exile in Babylon. God gave King Nebuchadnezzar a dream and showed him these five great empires. Nebuchadnezzar was the first of them, and they're all associated with metals. Gold being the first one, that's King Nebuchadnezzar. Silver being the second one. And the figure that he saw had a head of gold, and God referred to Nebuchadnezzar as the head of gold, the king of kings, because God established him as this powerful king. The second empire is the media Persian Empire. And we're going to read about these kings in Ezra and Nehemiah and Daniel, where you have King Cyrus, a Persian king, King Darius, King Ahasuerus, King Artaxerxes, these media Persian kings, and they're represented by silver. And then you have the bronze. And the metals get cheaper and cheaper as you go down. So the head of gold was the greatest Gentile king that God had set up. The silver is still a precious stone that's worth a lot. And that's a media Persian empire that God dealt with these people in the media Persian empire. He dealt through these Gentile kings. Then you go to the bronze, and the bronze is Alexander the Great, predicted, by the way, by Daniel, 
then you get to the iron and the two legs of the iron are the Roman Empire, predicted by Daniel, by the way. Uh, God revealed to Daniel these other empires that were to come in the future from when Daniel was alive. So you have the iron, the last empire is the feet that are iron mingled with clay. That is the empire of the Antichrist. That empire will occur in the Great Tribulation. There is a great stone in the dream that Nebuchadnezzar dreamed. When he dreamed of all these empires, and Daniel explains how the last one is associated with the Antichrist, has not occurred yet. The other four empires have occurred yet. I mean, they've already occurred, but the vestiges of them, the influences of them are very deep in our culture. The Greek system, people study Aristotle and Socrates and act like these are the wisest people in the world. They're really not compared to the scriptures. They, they, don't, they don't even hold a candle to the least of the prophets. But people, they have a reverence for Aristotle and for the Greek system. But what Nebuchadnezzar saw, though, is this great stone that was not cut out with hands, meaning it was God Almighty himself, come down and destroy all of these Gentile world kingdoms and empires going all the way through to the kingdom of the Antichrist at the end of this world, as we know it, in the Great Tribulation. And this stone crushes them and all the rulership and all the power and all the remainder of them is, is annihilated. And it goes away as it's described like chafe that is blown away by the wind and you find no remnant of it anymore. anymore. And that, big, that great stone is the Lord Jesus Christ when he returns at the end of the great tribulation, he is going to smite. He is going to destroy. He's going to crush. He's going to annihilate all the, all the remainder of Gentile, Gentile world rule that exists today. And he's going to become the king of kings and lord of lords over this world. And that's how the conclusion of what Nebuchadnezzar sees. And Daniel interpreted the dream to him. And Nebuchadnezzar initial, initially said to his magicians and the soothsayers and all the black magic people and the people around him, the psychics. And he told them, you tell me what my dream is. And you interpret the dream. And they said, we can't do that. You got to tell us what the dream is and we're going to interpret it. And he said, no, you tell me what the dream is and you interpret the dream. If you don't do that, I'm going to cut you into little pieces and I'm going to make your houses into a dung hill. That's what he told them. And he was going to kill off all these people. It would have been good riddance to them because a lot of them were just a bunch of evil psychics and, you know, people that were engaged in black magic. But he might have killed off Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego. So God Almighty revealed the dream to Daniel. And then Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar, I'm going to tell you your dream because the God of heaven has revealed it to me. And I'm going to tell you what the dream means. And Nebuchadnezzar had a change of heart. He used to be an idolater. And he started to realize right then and there, the God of Daniel was God Almighty. And there was nothing like that. But here we're, here we're going to deal with the silver, the media Persian empire in the book of Ezra. And we're going to look at this king of the media Persian empire, King Cyrus. And King Cyrus, God moved on King Cyrus. And he got King Cyrus to issue a proclamation. He, he inspired King Cyrus with the truth of what God had done to Cyrus, the Persian king. This is when Israel is in exile, by the way. And what God did is he did two things. He, he let King Cyrus know that King Cyrus was the king over all the nations. In other words, he had the power that God gave him to be the ruling authority, the most powerful king and empire over all the nations at the time. Now, he did not encompass the whole world, his empire. It was the area where Media Persia is, Babylon. He took over the empire of King Nebuchadnezzar, eventually 
because he he took over the uh, kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar's son, I believe it was. But it was in the area where Iran is, Iraq is, um, all the way through to Israel, and they had vast empires. So God let him know, you are the ruler over all nations. You have the power over all nations, number one. Number two, that he was given the God decreed job of having the Jewish temple built. And what Jewish temple was that he was going to have built? That was the second temple. The first one Nebuchadnezzar had destroyed. So the one that Solomon built was the first Jewish temple. The second, and that first Jewish temple was destroyed by the Babylonian Empire. The first of those five kingdoms that are significant off into the future. The second Jewish temple was built initially under the decree of King Cyrus because God Almighty inspired him to do that. God moved him to do that. This Gentile king. Why is this temple significant? Well, guess which temple was the one that when our Lord came to this earth in the form of a man, the Lord Jesus Christ, what temple do you think he walked in? The second temple, the one that King Cyrus, we're going to read about, moved Israel and the, the people that were in the captivity. God moved him and he pushed them to go build a temple, a house for God in Jerusalem. And that temple he built was the temple that existed when Jesus Christ walked the earth. And what happened to that Jewish temple? That temple was destroyed by the fourth empire, the Roman Empire. The third Jewish temple is going to be rebuilt in the Great Tribulation under the observation uh, and the authority of Elijah and Moses. That Jewish temple also, the fifth empire of the Antichrist, initially the Antichrist will enter into a covenant with Israel. And I believe he will be instrumental. He will be key in, in that third temple being rebuilt. The image of the feet where there was clay intermingled with iron, that's the Antichrist empire. He's going to be involved in the third temple. What happened to the second temple after Jesus Christ walked the earth and went into the temple and taught? And they rejected him and he died for our sins and he was raised from the dead. Well, in AD 70, Titus and the Roman army destroyed the second, the second temple that we're going to read about. King Cyrus issuing a command for it to be rebuilt. So let's take a look at that in Ezra chapter 1. In Ezra chapter 1, why don't we start in verse 1. <clears throat> now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of King Cyrus of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdoms and put it also in writing. And Jeremiah, remember from last week, predicted that because of the wickedness of Israel, Nebuchadnezzar would come into the land and destroy them and kill off a bunch of them. Some of them would die by the plague. Some of them would die by uh, famine. Some of them would die by the sword. And those that didn't die by those things would be taken off as slaves into Babylon. And then the land would rest. The land would rest from the wickedness, not only of Israel, but of these other nations that King Nebuchadnezzar went in and defeated in the land of Israel. There were other nations there. So the land would rest 70 years. And then Cyrus would send Jews back to Israel to build the second temple. And that's what this is about. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom, 
and put it also in writing, saying, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord God of heaven. And this is all true. This is inspired by God. This proclamation was what God stirred up the spirit of Cyrus to do and to proclaim. The Lord God of heaven have given me all the kingdoms of the earth, is what Cyrus stated. And that was true. He was the power over all the kingdoms of the earth, even though geographically his kingdom did not extend all over the earth. But God gave him all the kingdoms of the earth. He could have defeated any king or any ruler anywhere in the, in the earth, any people group. So God had given him all those kingdoms of the earth. And he hath charged me to build him and house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Get this. This is amazing. Here's a Gentile Persian king that is charged by God to build God's temple in Jerusalem. I find that amazing. And what he does is he says to the Jews, who is there among you of all his people? The people of God. His God be with him and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is the God. The house of the Lord God of Israel. He is the God which is in Jerusalem. And so what happened, if you go down to verse 7, is also Cyrus the king brought forth the vessels of the house of the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar had brought forth out of Jerusalem. And had put them in the house of his gods. Yes, Nebuchadnezzar was an idolater. But he learned who the God of heaven and the God of the earth was. Later in time when God dealt with him. But Nebuchadnezzar had taken all these incredibly crafted things from the temple of God. And when he destroyed the temple, they carted those things off back to Babylon. With the people that they took back as slaves and in chains. And there's an accounting of them here. Cyrus said, bring these back with you to Jerusalem and put them in the house of God that you're going to build. And so there's, you could see them listed here and what they are. It's, it's quite extraordinary how many gold vessels there were and how many thousands of charges of silver and all these different uh, basins of gold and, and hundreds of other vessels and different things, um, 5,400 vessels of gold and silver. And all of these were to go back to Israel and be placed back in the temple, second temple, when that second temple was built. So let's move on to chapter two. Now you have another one of these very specific lists of people. These are all the people that went back to Jerusalem under the grace and the beneficence of King Cyrus. He allowed them all to go. He encouraged them to go. Whoever the people are, of God are, he basically is telling them, you go back there and you build the house of God. And I'm going to bless you when you go back and Build the house of God is what Cyrus was telling him. And Cyrus was encouraging this. And so here you have details on all the families and the numbers of them that went back to Israel. And there's, there's verse after verse of all of these people. And the total number of them, I believe, is in verse 64. 42,360 of these people went back to Israel to help build the temple and move back to Israel. And there, there are Levites, there are people from different tribes, there are people from all over Israel, there are people from Bethlehem and other places that you'll recognize. Um, there were 123 people in verse 21 from Bethlehem. And the Levites went, went and the porters, the singers, the nethanims, and all these groups of people, the priests, uh, and there they were. They went off back to Israel. So even though Israel in general is in exile, these people are sent back by King Cyrus. Let's move on to chapter 3. And here we see in chapter 3 how 
when they lay the foundation for the temple, there is this amazing time of rejoicing and weeping. They are so overwhelmed by doing this that they are absolutely happy. And at the same time, they're, they're crying for tears of joy. You can't tell what it is, weeping for whatever reason. But if you start, I think it's in verse 10. And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, keep remembering this. This is a temple that Jesus walked in. Uh, this was about 500 and something BC. So over 500 years later, the Lord Jesus Christ walked in this temple. And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, they set the priest in their apparel with trumpets and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with symbols to praise the Lord after the ordinance of David, king of Israel. And they sang together by chorus in praising and giving thanks unto the Lord because he is good for his mercy endureth forever toward Israel. And all the people shouted with a great shout. You can imagine this, 43,000 people that get to go back to their land. But they not only get to go back to their land, they get to build the temple of the Lord there. And they're shouting with a great shout. And they're praising the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the priests and the Levites and the chief of the fathers, who were ancient men, they had seen the first house. In other words, they saw the house that Nebuchadnezzar had destroyed. They had seen that. And when the foundation of this house, the second temple, was laid before their eyes, wept with a loud voice, and many shouted aloud for joy. So they're crying and they're shouting for joy and they're praising God. And in verse 13, so that the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noise of the weeping of the people. For the people shouted with a loud shout and the noise was heard afar off. And of course, there's always opposition. You think everything is going so smoothly. You've got King Cyrus proclaiming that you can do this and blessing it and all that. And oh, everything's going to go great. Well, no, it isn't. If you're doing anything for God, there's always going to be opposition. No matter what, there's going to be those in your own family, in other people's families, in friends, in among the believers in Christian churches all around you. When you really set down that you're going to serve God, you're always going to get opposition within and without. Paul wrote about that. Paul was afraid of these people that he had actually show, shared the gospel with. They became so ungodly, some of them. You know, they scared him in the way they were. And they turn against him and think of the Lord Jesus Christ. Who was it that betrayed him? It was not only his own people, Israel. It was not only those in Judah. But it was his own familiar friend, Judas Iscariot, stabbed him right in the back. And that's what's going to happen when you're serving the Lord. So what do they have? Well, you go to Ezra chapter 4, verse 1. Now, when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the children of the captivity builded the temple unto the Lord God of Israel, then they came to Zerubbabel, who was the, uh, the chief of these uh, Israelites that were rebuilding the temple. And they sort of asked them, they said unto them, oh, let us build with you, for we seek your God as you do. And the Jews said, oh, no, you know, we're going to be building it. You don't have anything to do with this. And then they wrote Cyrus, king of Persia. And the people that resisted the building of the temple, verse 4, then the people of the land weakened the hands of the people of Judah and trouble them in building. You'll see the same stuff in Nehemiah. You got to be on guard 24-7. And in Nehemiah, they had to be armed and ready because people would attack them at any time and conspire against them. And a similar thing is happening here. People are weakening the hands of them. They have adversaries and trouble them. And verse 5, and what they did is the adversaries hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose. All the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. And the Persian media empire is considered one. It's called the media Persian empire. So there was trouble all the way through this time with all these adversaries. And then what, what happens is 
they're basically trying to write, they're writing the king and they're saying, here's what the Jews are doing. And there's, there's an answer for this, that the Jews, they basically encapsulate the answer of the Jews in what is happening here uh, concerning why they're building the temple. And the Jews are reminding them, Cyrus commanded this. That's what happened. Cyrus commanded this. And, uh, you know, and the, the opposition went all the way through to the kingdom of Darius. And they got one of the Artaxerxes, which some say this Artaxerxes here is the same as Ahasuerus, who are media Persian kings. But later there's another Artaxerxes, and then there seems to be a third Artaxerxes. So anyway, they, they got him, tried to get him to stop the building of the temple. And he did that. He did stop some of that from occurring. And then it goes all the way, if you go to Ezra chapter 5, and start in verse 5. All this opposition occurred, but eventually the Jews kept on building it. And verse 5, but the eyes of their God was upon the elders of the Jews, that they could not cause them to cease till the matter came to Darius. And then they returned answer by letters concerning this matter. So this was a letter that was sent to King Darius. And these are people that are actually trying to stop the building of the temple. Uh, and they say, be it known unto the king that we went into the province of Judah to the house of the great God, which is built with great stones. And it gets into all the things of that. And um, then asked we these, those elders that were building it basically and said unto them, who commanded you to build this house and to make up these walls? So that this is the opposition saying, who gave you the right to do this? And they wrote to Darius and the Jews, and they incorporate in their letter what the Jews said. So uh, the Jews said, when, you know, they asked the elders of Israel, who commanded you to build this house and who certified this? And they brought the names of these people. And this is what the Jews said. And thus they returned us answer saying, and this is all in this letter to King Darius. But this is what the Jews told those that were asking them, under what authority are you doing this? Verse 11 of Ezra chapter 5. We are the servants of the God of heaven and earth and build the house that, that was builded these many years ago, which a great king of Israel builded and set up. And they're talking about the first temple built by King Solomon. They're building that house. You see, they're building the second temple because basically it was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. But that, that's what they say they're doing. And build the house that was built these many years ago, which a great king of Israel built and set up. But after that, our, fathered, our fathers, I'm sorry, had provoked the God of heaven unto wrath. He gave them, that's Israel, into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. The Chaldeans, who were the Babylonians, who destroyed this house and carried the people away into Babylon. But in the first year of Cyrus, the king of Babylon, the same King Cyrus made a decree to build this house of God. And the vessels also of gold and silver of the house of God, which Nebuchadnezzar took out of the temple that was in Jerusalem and brought them into the temple of Babylon. Those did Cyrus the king take out of the temple of Babylon and they were delivered unto one whose name was Shezbazar, whom he made governor. And said unto him, and this is describing what Cyrus did, take these vessels, go carry them into the temple that is Jerusalem, and let the house of God be builded in his place. Then came the same Sheshbazar and laid the foundation of the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. And since that time, even until now, have it been in building, yet it is not finished. Now, therefore, if it seems good to the king, and now this is addressing Darius, let there be search made in the king's treasure, which is there at Babylon, whether it be so that a decree was made of Cyrus, the king, to build this house of God at Jerusalem. And let the king send his pleasure to us concerning this matter. In other words, they're testing it. And they're saying, do these Jews really have the authority under King Cyrus to build this temple? And you search it out, King Darius, and let us know what your pleasure is. And then in, in chapter 6, we see King Darius' response. Then Darius, the king, made a decree 
and search was made in the house of the rolls, where the treasures were laid up in Babylon. And there was found at Achmetha in the palace that is in the province of, Me of the Medes, a roll, and therein was a record thus written. In the first year of Cyrus, the king, the same Cyrus, the king, made a decree concerning the house of God at Jerusalem. Let the house be builded the place where they offered sacrifices and let the foundations thereof be strongly laid. So he gets into this. This is what Cyrus wrote. This was found in a roll, in a written roll that King Darius found. And it gets into building the house of the Lord. And it gets into returning all the vessels of the Lord that belong in the house of the Lord that Nebuchadnezzar had taken away. And so Darius realizes um, that this needs to be done. And so you look at verse 7, and Darius states, Let the work of this house of God alone. Let the governor of the Jews and the elders of the Jew, Jews build this house of God in his place. Moreover, I make a decree what ye shall do to the elders of these Jews for the building of the house of God, that of the king's goods, even of the tribute beyond the river, Forthwith, expenses be given unto these men, that they be not hindered, and that which they have need of, both young bullocks and rams, and gets into all these things, for offerings to God, the God of heaven, he's calling it, that that be given to them, and then it fail not, that they may offer sacrifices of sweet savors unto the God of heaven, and watch this, and pray for the life of the king and of his sons. Darius was a wise king. He was a godly king. So was Cyrus. They realized who the God of heaven was. He was the Lord God of Israel. And so what Darius is saying, you make sure sacrifices are made to the God of heaven. And you pray, you make sure as part of his decree, you pray for my life. And you pray for my sons. And that's what he says in his decree. But he gets even more intense. Verse 11. Also, I have made a decree that whosoever shall act, alter this word, okay? If anybody changes my words and my decree, let timber be pulled down from his house and being set up, let him be hanged thereon. So you pull down the, the wood from this your house, okay? And this person that alters my decree, hang that person on that wood and let his house be made a dunghill for this. The same thing that Nebuchadnezzar said about his magicians and all those psychics and false prophets of evil that could not tell him what his dream was. He said, I'm going to chop you in pieces and make your houses in dunghills. That seemed to be the thing with these great empire rulers because he's threatening the same thing. Darius, let his house be made a dunghill for this. If you alter his decree on building the house of God, on bringing the things back to the house of God and on blessing the people of that are building the house of God. And that and the God that hath caused his name to dwell there destroy all kings and people that shall put their hand to alter and to destroy this house of God, which is at Jerusalem. I, Darius, have made a decree. Let it be done with speed. So that's what Darius <coughs> decreed, excuse me, and required. And that's what happened. So they have this other decree that goes out, and you'll see there, there are several more, but I haven't even gotten to um, <clears throat> Ezra himself. So Ezra is part of this group that goes back. And what we see about him is in chapter seven um, that Ezra is, is going back there, um, and he goes back, and let's turn, turn to chapter seven. And why don't we take a, a look at verse one? Now, after these things in the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, this is later on, Ezra, the son of Sariah, the son of Azariah, um, he goes and he goes up with the children of Israel. And there's another decree by King Artaxerxes. And it's the decree that basically um, those who want to, anybody who wants to, basically, you go back to Jerusalem of your own free will. And you got to understand, these people were in bondage in Babylon. They were in bondage. They were carted off as servants and slaves to Nebuchadnezzar. And they, they aren't free people necessarily. 
but these kings are letting them go and King Artaxerxes is letting them go for a reason. He wants silver to be given to them in verse 15 and gold be given to them and um, and, he, and the, which the king and his counselors have freely offered on the God of Israel. So Artaxerxes is offering to the God of Israel whose habitation he recognizes is in Jerusalem and all the silver and gold that thou canst find in the provinces of Babylon with the free will offering and of the priests offering willingly for the house of their God, which is in Jerusalem. So what he's doing is he's, he's doing a similar thing to what Darius did and to what Cyrus did, King Cyrus, King Darius. So he's doing this and offering gold and offering all this stuff to the God of heaven, the God of Israel, and that it be taken back and these people go back of their free will offerings. Now, why is he doing all of this? Anything needful for the house of God and anything needful, by the way, for Jerusalem uh, and anything needful that they take. And he would supply a lot of this. And he made the decree to all the treasurers, which are beyond the river, that whatsoever Ezra the priest, and Ezra is a Levite, he's a priest, right? Whatever Ezra the priest, the scribe of the law of the God of heaven, notice that he recognized him that this is the scribe of the law of the God of heaven, shall require of you it be done, it be done speedily. And he gets into all these other things, the weed and the wine and the you know, in addition to the gold and all this other wealth, all these other things. But watch why he does this. Here's why he does it. Whatsoever is commanded by the God of heaven, in other words, whatever you need, and this is probably the decree that was issued for, uh, that you you see in the book of Daniel, but this is the, the decree in which the walls of Jerusalem were to be rebuilt and the streets and so forth. And he says, this is why he does it. Watch his motivation. Whatsoever is commanded by the God of heaven, let it be diligently done for the house of the God of heaven. For why should there be wrath against the realm of the king and his sons? He's doing it for selfish reasons because he realizes this is a God of heaven. You go bless the God of heaven for me because I don't want wrath upon me or upon my sons. Just like there was a prayer that that one king said wanted a prayer made for him and his sons that he live a long life. Oh, yes, these people are wising up to who God is. Also, we certify you that touching any of the priests and Levites, and he gives a long list of different things. It shall not be lawful to impose, impose toll, tribute, custom upon them. You can't even tax the priests and the Levites. And that's a pretty amazing thing. That government is saying you're not allowed to tax these people. But I'm gonna I'm about to finish up. But I want to just mention one more thing about Ezra. Ezra is crying and he's weeping and he's so sad because he realized when he was going back there that Israel had intermingled with all the different people groups and they had mingled with all these different people. Um, and it really, really bothered him. And he was so ashamed that they had violated the laws of God and intermingled with people that worshiped other gods. And so you see in Ezra, this shame that he's suffering, uh, that, you know, he was very sad about what he was observing there because the intermingling, and it's kind of a sad thing because they make a decision that look, um, Let's, let's have those people that marry these wives of other nations to break away from them. And so you'll see this, this whole episode about Ezra. And that's one of the things that the book ends with is in verse, um, verse six of chapter nine of Ezra and said, oh my God, I am ashamed and blush to lift up my face to thee, my God, for our iniquities are increased over our head. And he's referring to the people of Israel, by the way, and the priests and the Levites and everyone in verse one. And verse two, I left this out, but I should go over it. In verse two, he, he, he said, for they have taken of their daughters for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy seed have been mingled themselves with the people of those lands. And he names them, the people according to their abominations, 
the people of the land and their abominations, even the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. And he says they have mingled with these people. And he is ashamed of it. So in his prayer, he says, oh my God, I am ashamed and blush to lift up my face to thee, my God, for our iniquities are increased over our head and our trespass has grown up onto the heavens. Since the days of our fathers, have we been in a great trespass unto this day for our iniquities? Have we, our kings and our priests, been delivered into the hands of the kings of the lands? to the sword, to captivity, and to spoil, and to confusion of face, as it is this day. And now for a little space, grace hath been chewed from the Lord our God to leave us a remnant, to escape, and to give us a nail in his holy place, that our God may lighten our eyes and give us a little reviving in our bondage. You see the grace that he recognized when he allowed them, God did, to go back to Israel and build the temple and the house of God? For we are bond men. That was their condition in exile. They were bond people. They were not free. But these wise and great kings gave them freedom of their free will to return to Israel. For we are bond men. Yet our God hath not forsaken us in our bondage, but hath extended mercy unto us in the sight of the kings of Persia. To give us a reviving, to set up the house of our God and to repair the desolations thereof, and to give us a wall in Judah and in Jerusalem. That links it to, by the way, the prophecy of Daniel 9, which we're going to study when we get in Daniel 9. I believe this is a decree. It's referring to the walls of Jerusalem. I believe it was this decree issued by Artaxerxes, the wall in Judah and Jerusalem. And now, O oh our God, what shall we say after this? For we have forsaken thy commandments. Why do they forsake the commandments? Well, there's all kinds of explanation for those. But he gives some of them here, which thou hast commanded, commanded by thy servants, the prophet, saying, The land unto which ye go to possess it is an unclean land with filthy, filthiness to the people of the land, with their abominations, which they have filled it from one end to another with their uncleanness. So the land... There, before Israel went and conquered it, the Canaanites, the Philistines, the Amorites, all these people were a filthy people. In other words, they engaged in all kinds of dreadful sin. We studied that extensively. I don't need to get into that. If you haven't uh, been on these studies in the past, go back on my previous studies, Journey Through the Bible. I teach about that in a lot of chapters. But they filled it from one end to another of the land with their uncleanness. Um, and, and now he says, now, therefore, Give not your daughters unto their sons, neither take their daughters unto your sons. And he, he's going to back to what God had commanded them through his prophets, under the law and all the way through the prophets. Don't intermingle with those people so you don't do the evil of them. And then but he, he, what he explains is they intermingled. And after all that has come upon us for our evil deeds and for our great trespass, seeing that our God hath punished us less than our iniquities deserve, has given us such deliverances, should we again break thy commandments and join in, if in affinity with the people of these abominations? Wouldest not, not thou be angry with us till thou hast consumed us, so that there should be no remnant nor escaping. And then he gets into it, how they did. They mingled with all these people. And you could get into that about all the mingling with all these people. And in verse one of chapter 10, Ezra is praying and confessing and weeping and casting himself down before the house of God. And there assembled him out of Israel, a great congregation of men and women. And they get into this thing about all these strange wives that people have intermingled with in the land. And I'm going to end it on that note. But you'll see a list of those people that have done that and how bad it is in the eyes of God. But this is, this is a, I mean, this topic, when you get into these kings and realize Four of the empires are gone. One of them is yet to come in the Great Tribulation. They're all associated with the Jewish temples. One of them, Nebuchadnezzar, as I mentioned, destroyed the first Jewish temple. Another one, King Cyrus, king of Persia, started the rebuilding of the second Jewish temple. And so did Darius and Artaxerxes and a bunch of these others, kings of Persia. Then the other one, the fifth empire. Oh, oh, let me add this. 
the fourth empire, Rome, were, were the ones that destroyed the second Jewish temple that we're reading about the building of right here in the book of Ezra. The fourth empire destroyed the second Jewish temple. The fifth empire is going to be that of the Antichrist, the world rulership of the Antichrist. And he'll have opposition. He's not going to be without opposition around the world. There are going to be those that stand against him and nations that stand against him. But he is going to have a covenant with Israel that you can read about, and he's going to break it. But when he breaks that covenant with Israel, he's going to go into the third Jewish temple, which is yet to be rebuilt. We don't know when it's going to be built. It's going to be built, though. And I know it's going to be associated with Elijah and Moses who are going to return to this earth and manifest themselves as prophets of Israel in Jerusalem for three and a half years. And that's when the third Jewish temple is going to be there. All right. Thank you for attending tonight, for watching tonight, for listening tonight. And God bless you all. And I look forward to another study through the great word of God, continuing our, our study through the Bible, our journey through the Bible next week. God bless you. Good night.